to the Coaches Coffee Club. Really excited about some um, upcoming guests over the next little while. And tonight we start with Callum. Um, as a brief introduction to, to Callum's CV, um, clubs in his past, I, f- I believe, are Oldham Athletic, Manchester yeah. City, um, and currently um, the under-18s coach at Ipswich Town. So, Callum, thanks very much for joining us. No, no, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Look, mate, what 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 we try to do is um, talk through like what what, is, what what coaching has looked like, does look like, and might look like for you personally in the future. But we feel that we have different people, different um, people with different interests and backgrounds and types of coaching that they're involved with. So we feel like um, talking on on a on a sort of comfortable level about about football and about football coaching gives a variety of different people um real real good opportunity to take from from your experiences and, and and what you and we love about the game so if you wouldn't mind I know and I just mentioned a couple of your clubs there and you know probably not done you justice mate but um if you could just give us a little bit of a background on 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 yourself and 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 you know what you've done so far in in terms of your, your coaching and and, yeah. and education yeah I um I, I played um I was a goalkeeper. Um, the reason I'm a good coach is because I've watched a lot of football from the bench. I wasn't, I wasn't the, I was very rarely the number one. So I was sat next to a lot of managers and coaches. So I think that's what gave me an head start in it. I, um, I was at Oldham as a kid. Then went to Bradford. Had a small time at Ipswich and a small time at Barrow. Um, as you normally hear, a bad injury kind of put the brakes on it. Um, while I was injured and. While I was at Barrow, it was one of them where you start realising that a lot of the wages aren't livable. So it's time to start looking at other things. And while I was an apprentice, the kind of coaching badges were something that I really enjoyed. You're doing with your apprenticeship with the PFA. I was lucky. I had someone called Andy Barlow who was like really open, really honest and really like thorough in you doing it. Took it really like serious and it was good for me. It's what like kind of like my first kind of instinct of like oh I might actually be all right at this um from that I um while looking for a club I I actually reached out to an old friend who owned a like a school's coaching company um and I said listen I'm looking for a club and he said I can't help you with a club but I can help you with some casual work playgrounds lunchtime sports clubs after school clubs um do you want to like kind of do it yeah I need the money (laughs) um Let's get cracking. Let's see how we go. And I'll be honest, I say to everyone now and everyone that asked me while I was at Oldham, while I was at City and now while I'm at Ipswich, it was the best thing I ever did. If you can make a playground with 80 kids on it and have a game of cricket and a game of football and skipping and a game of tag and make it work with people that don't want to be there, then having 18 boys and a nice pitch and a bag of footballs and everyone wanting to be there is the easiest thing you can do in the world. So so that was where I kind of started. And then I reached out to one of my old uh, coaches at Oldham, Tony Phyllis-Girk, who, um, in my opinion, is one of the best coaches I think I've, I, I've ever had anyway. Like, he actually released me as a player and I still have got so much like time and respect for him. Um, it was a surreal moment a couple of months back. Um, I actually played against, coached against him. It was like a real like, wow, this has gone full circle this now. Um, and Tony kind of let me come into Oldham. Being a goalkeeper, I helped out with goalkeepers. So I did a bit with that. I had a part-time job at a grammar school coming as well, being a, like a head of coaching for football. So I had, it was one of them when I very first started, it was seven days a week. It was doing bits of everything. Um, and then I was really lucky at the end of the year at Oldham City kind of said, we'd like you to come in part time. Similar, still had everything going part time, seven days a week. And then I was very, very lucky. Um, two coaches um, at City kind of saw something in me and mentioned me to a, a man called Rodolfo Burrell, who is Guardiola's assistant now, who at the time was our um, kind of technical director. Um, a job came up at City and they put me forward the two coaches and Rodo agreed and that's where it kind of went full time then it became my job um I did nine years at City and worked with every age group so I've done the under sixes the under sevens the under eights 
nine, tens, elevens, twelves, thirteens, and fourteens, fifteens out with the sixteens. And then when I my last post was I was helping out with the under eighteens. Um so I did the kind of full cycle. Um and then yeah, this job came up at Ipswich and having spent a small time playing there, it it it's a huge club. Like I think it's one of the rarest things in England to be like a like one club town, one club city almost, where it's like there's no one kind of really, really close by. Um fans are incredible. Like I, I was like incredibly fortunate enough to be there the day they got promoted and to it's, listen, I've been to when they've lifted Premier Leagues and went to the Champions League final with City and that's great. And but this is just a different kind of feeling. Um so when the job came up with the first team manager we've got and the academy manager who are both big appeals to kind of come to Ipswich. It was, uh, yeah, it was a really a kind of exciting opportunity and one I've so far in the short time I've been here really enjoyed. So yeah, that's kind of my journey up until now. Brilliant. There's um, so much of it. I'm passionate about so much, so much of, of what you've, um, what you've done. I think two of the things that jump out of me straight away that, that, I'd like to know a little bit more about is you said there about goalkeeping and I had a, I had a friend who never quite cracked it and broke into the team. And he used to say to me, I feel like a supporter. I feel like I just drive around the country, sit on the bench and watch the team in the same way that people are, are paying to follow their team most weeks. And, and he stopped and went into coaching. Um, but one of the things that fascinates me is what you just said there about sitting there and watching, spending time around the coach and the manager to get a little bit more of a feel from it. And goalkeep, goalkeepers have not notoriously or not, over the years, I've never really had that for, mm. for a position where you spend so much of your time watching football yeah. from a, from a slightly removed position, as, you know, as much as you're involved in the game. Um, was it something while you were sitting there that you knew it was coming? You knew you were developing yeah. an interest in? Yeah. I, so when I was in high school, I did both. And then I had a point at 16 where I had a decision to make. I'm quite tall and I was quite tall at 16. So it helped playing up front that you got your head on most things, but also helped when you went in net. Um, and I, I, I kind of, I never really wanted to be a goalie coach. The best way I can put it is, is that if you asked me to explain why I was good at goalkeeping, I probably couldn't tell you. I, I probably couldn't teach you how I could teach you bits because I've done it enough, but I probably couldn't say this is why. If you asked me to talk about outfield, I can teach you. I can right, teach yeah. you from scratch. I can build you all the way up. I can be as, as complex. Or, and that's where kind of my passion is. I, I always used to joke and say, like, the view I've had of the game is probably one of the first tactical cams. Yeah. Like, yeah wait, that's if, what, I think that's I, what leads to me asking, yeah. asking that question, really. Yeah, and I, I think that there's not many. So, like, I'm really lucky at Ipswich. So, Lee Grant works in the first team. Um Granty works with the forwards, which I think 10, 15 years ago, oh, that doesn't make sense. When I think now what we know, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, Nuno, Espirito Santo was a goalkeeper, but they are, the, they're not, they're, they're not many. Um, and yeah, I, I always think that if you've been a, if you've been a goalkeeper, you've seen a lot of the whole game. You've seen a lot, you yeah. very rarely have a short of you. Granted, you don't know the stuff that, like, or you don't, you've not had the view of the pitch of a midfielder or a fullback, but I think if you're obsessed about coaching enough, you can learn that. Like, it, it, I, I knew that, so I had to obsess over coaching. It meant yeah. late nights, it meant watching a lot of games, it meant watching and other coaches and like speaking to like position specific people. And I was really lucky at City to have someone like Alan Wright, who's played countless games as a fullback. So you go and ask him. About yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. So you're, you're really lucky with stuff. Um, so, yeah. So, and like I say, I spent a lot of time on the bench. So I know a lot about what managers are looking at, the conversations. Um, I actually, I like if people watch me coach, they actually see I stand in normally two places, either behind the play or at the side of the pitch. It's where I spend most of my time. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I naturally gravitate to there, but, but yeah, I think it's, I think I had like, like I say, but when, when I did my first coaching badge with my apprenticeship, because it was outfield, it kind of sparked a thing where I was like, I'm all right at this. Like, I, I actually do know what I might be on about here. Yeah. Now I actually know nothing, but. Yeah. 
so, so I don't miss out on, on the opportunity. That was the other half of, as I said, the, the two things that really jumped out at me. But you said there about doing your coaching badge as an apprentice. And I think um, we've had people on here before that that talked about doing their level two or whatever it would have been called at the time that they did it. And, and, I, and I, having seen the scholars and youth team players over many, many years go through the process, so many of them don't realise the benefit that it brings to them and their game, but also the opportunities that it can bring them further down the line. Was that something that you were you were into? Do you know what I mean? Was, yeah. you, was you a bit of a different one in your group, I suppose, that, that, that um, really had the, the, the bit for it? Yeah and no. I was probably part of the majority. There was one or two who didn't have any interest in it, which is fine. We were really lucky that like my youth team coach, my first year was uh, Dave Weatherall, who's head of yeah. Yeah. NFL now. Like Dave was like super intelligent. <laughs> I always used to joke he's almost too intelligent to be a coach. <laughs> he's like he's like he's a great guy. He really kind of like lads. This is really important. Um, Andy Barlow was really serious, and at the time, I think a lot of us were like. Wow, but like looking back, we yeah. actually really great. He has to be like, I really like, we're almost really grateful he was like that. Um, same when I, I did my B license with the PFA, and you have like Jeff Lomax and Neil Bailey, who were just like, like they help you get better, they tell you as it is, but they keep the uh, uh, excitement for learning and growing. And like, the, like I think sometimes, like, you hear some stories of people and it's like, oh, they put me off it. It's like, no, no, the best ones, the best like coach educators are like the ones that fuel it and keep it. They tell you as it is. And it's not all like, it's not false. It's not, you're great at everything, but they keep that kind of, um, and, and the other bit as well, you, you get money as an apprentice, if you complete it, it's yeah. like, like it is, it's a big, like I'm doing it now. I'm saying it to like the under 18s that I've had the short time working with. It's like, Whatever your motivation is, if it's you want to be coaching, there's a motivation to get it. If you're financially motivated, there's a reason to get it. You shouldn't you should be able to find motivation to do it. Yeah. And I think you you made a great point there about the opportunities. Like I look at my life now where I've been, people I've worked with, and it's come from just doing that level two, like doing it properly and like really embracing it. And it's like yeah. hindsight's a great thing, but yeah, it's uh it's been worth its weight. Good. No, it's refreshing to hear because like I say, I feel that a lot of the time, probably I'm probably going back a little bit further down the line, but you talk 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 to or listen to 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 a lot of people and it was a little bit like I had to do it, so I did it. And then I sort of almost had to had to find it again when the back end of my career came along. And I yeah. think we all know what benefits players get from understanding that little bit more about coaching and once you start coaching, I think as a certainly the players that that I've had relationships with that have coached while they're still playing have found it's given them so many benefits towards their game. So um, it's refreshing to hear how open minded you was at that time, uh, because ultimately you're training to be a footballer, aren't you? And yeah, that's, yeah. That's the, the bit at the front, and and as your boys are now, they they've, they've still got that bit between the teeth, which you want them to have of yeah. of becoming yeah. professional footballers. But if you've got that as well, I think it. It, it stands you in good stead as it has with yourself, but but at the same time you can um can, it can benefit your own game as well. Um, yeah, just one other bit, little bit, just to to take out of what you said there in your introduction, and I said it's something I'm extremely passionate about. But you talked about playground games and your introduction to 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 getting your hands dirty as a coach, and I, I always referred it to it as like tying people shoelaces. That was all it ever started out as, yeah. from my perspective, but. Um, tell us a little bit more about some of those environments because I think the bit that I took the most out of is we talk about oh we work we, you know work with grassroots players or worked in a primary school but you mentioned there about a game of cricket a game of tag some skipping football I think that's even more valuable that, uh, part of it that people don't probably um, value enough as to what all of them other sports whether you got qualifications in them yeah. or not delivering them how, how that evolve, evolves you and helps you as a coach and I, like it I think the big thing is 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 you have to, in a school you have to teach a sport that's probably not now I'm like, I come from a really sporty family my brother my little brother unfortunately is very good at everything so he's a good footballer but he's a good cricketer he's good at golf but like like listen I can play cricket but I'm far from a cricketer far far from. and 
if you can teach a sport that's not your sport to someone that doesn't want to be there and couldn't think of anything worse to do, and you can find a way to make a connection, make it work, see improvement, get their buy-in, you've cracked it. So you can have all, like, listen, I, I'm really passionate about tactics, really passionate about techniques. I am, like, but I can have all that knowledge. If I don't have that skill, it's not worth, it's not worth the, like, anything. It's not worth anything. You can have all the knowledge that the, I listened to Sam Allardyce talking. I know he's not on a great run at the minute, but he was saying the first thing you have to do is, like, get the buy-in, get people thinking my way. I can tell you where to stand. I can tell you how to do it. I can show you how to do it, but it's, so that was the big that was the big thing for me. And it, it was it's the other bits as well. It's the behavior management, it's the session management, it's your timings, it's knowing that you've got to get them back inside because they're gonna miss another lesson. It's all them little bits that you can't like having eyes in the back of your head, you yeah. see more, you look like and I, I just think I think now people can it, it, it's not attractive to do that step course it isn't we all want to be stood on the touchline of a premier league club i'm no different we all want to be a premier league manager but you've got to do that step you've got it like you for me you've got to especially if you if you have an ambition to be a really good development coach and a really good academy coach that's as good as any cpd it's as good as any because once you've got that then you go and do the other stuff then you go and watch the master of the tactics the master of the techniques that that's when you come but that bit is like a really important building block um and it's humbling as well like when i did it i was like it's like it's all it's it's awkward to like be in a situation where you go oh this is new like there's a kid fighting <laughs> up there. and i was i was i was really lucky that i had like real range so i worked in a school in the middle of moss side which in manchester's it's a tough place to grow up yeah um similar to where I grew up. So I had that, which was great. I then also worked in a grammar school, which is the yeah, polar, polar opposite. Polar, polar. I, I have like a lad who is wanting to be a footballer, comes from nothing and really tough upbringing to another lad who has to leave me lesson early to catch a private jet to go and watch a Champions League game. If yeah. you can deal with both. And that's like, that, that, that's the thing I think where it's, it's, it, especially the, the the younger age group stuff it's 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 so so important to just get that that them personal skills them how to build a relationship how to like a lot a lot of the time I was going into school and teaching people that didn't look like me how do how do I make a connection with you then if it, if you don't look like me and you don't sound like me well how how do I make a connection with you then I'm a six foot three broad mancunian fella how do I make a connection with someone that's not that that yeah. really, really important skill set to kind of kind of have in your armour? Yeah, uh, Chris Ramsey used to say you was a salesman of in, in one in one breath, and and Ronald McDonald with a pair of copers on in, in in another, and I think it's perfect the perfect analogy. And I think what you just said there is massive because everybody whoever's listening to this will have that that dynamic in their group. So if they're an academy coach, they will might not have a kid getting on a plane to yeah. Champions League final, know, yeah. and they won't have the extreme difference, but they will have difference, and they yeah. will have to um, sell themselves to somebody that doesn't look like them or behave like them or have the same background and experiences. So I'm um, I'm, I'm I'm with you all the way in terms of uh, going through very very similar experiences as a young coach and it, it, it for me it's invaluable in terms of being able to like you said have the eyes in the back of the head to be able to put the good with the bad to be able to manage the big with the small the you know the 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 real variations in your group and we will all have them you'll have them in your in your under 18s at the moment you will have a best player and a worst player and you will have a player going through lack of confidence and one that's sky high and and it, it is all part of those experiences as to as to where and, and how you got them. Before we go on to some of your other um, your clubs and you know some of the work that you've done when we start touching a little bit more on your foot, actual football coaching, from an education point of view, tell us a little bit more, because James, if you've got anything on this, jump in as well, yeah. mate. But um, yeah. just tell us a little bit more about that, because I think sometimes we 
get caught up in courses. Yeah. You mentioned about having good tutors and, and yeah, yeah. those good experiences are great. But just tell us, tell us a little bit more about sort of where you feel on top of that background, where your sort of real experiences and, and learning yeah. have come from as well. I, um, like, this is where I old James one. James dragged me through my degree. <laughs> um, no, I was at, like, I, I realised once I started coaching that it was kind of like, this is something I want to do. Like, this is... I was re- like, I was really honest with myself. I thought my dad didn't believe me that like I'm probably not going to play in the Premier League. Like, it's probably like time to start looking at different avenues. Um, I toyed with the idea of becoming a teacher. Uh, I went and did two months and realised that I don't want to be a teacher full time. I don't want to be a like. It, I don't want to be in a classroom. That's not for. That's <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I can teach you cricket, but I'm not sure I want to teach you how to count. <laughs> like, yeah. um, like, and then that that's where kind of my my degree kicked in. I saw it. If I remember rightly, James, I applied like a week before the deadline, didn't I? Yeah. I had to rush everything through. It was like a last minute. I remember, I remember being <clears> at <throat> the car park of a primary school and the email coming through saying we can do it, but we need to do it quick <laughs> um, to get onto this year. Um, and that was a kind of like my first experience where it was. The stuff behind coaching, if that makes sense, like the stuff like the beyond the X's and O's, beyond just putting a football session on, understanding pedagogy. Like I never heard that word. Like what's like no one's ever explained that to me. What's that word mean? Like um, understanding like the the physical side of the game, like all the the psychology. I mean, uh, Tom Bates came in the psychological side. And you're like this is a whole other kind of um world that was just eye opening and kind of I, I look back now and I, it, it it that was another really humbling experience that you like I just I've been coaching for a couple of years and you think oh <laughs> I've cracked it and then you go there and you go like you've got no idea like <laughs> you've not even scratched the surface on what you need to know what the best know and what these the level of these experts are um so yeah, so I got I dragged through three degrees, uh, three years of the degree. Yeah, I got dragged through. Um, somehow managed to pass it, which was, I was the first person in my family to get a degree. So it was a big step forward. Um, yeah, still don't think I look great in the the hat and gown like, but um, but yeah, that that was kind of like my first kind of real step away from your traditional county FAs, PFA, FA education, where I think I took like. Yeah, I took a lot of learning from that. Um, a lot of around the pitch is probably the best way to put like best way to put it. It but strengthened on the pitch. I, I, like my understanding of how people learn, understanding the physical side of the game was like massive for me. Like it's still something now that I'm trying. I think it's probably my area where I can still get miles better. Um, and then other bits like really practical bits like sports cold when we were doing it sports cold was like on the periphery of stuff and it was like just coming in and it's like like that now I, I couldn't imagine not analysing a game analysing training something as simple as micing yourself up I'd never done that before sit and listen to yourself what do you like what do you actually say <laughs> like you, you talk like you, are you saying anything or are you saying nothing like little bits like that that really kind of like progress me and understanding the importance of language so yeah so it was a the real kind of step forward to kind of like broaden my rise and broaden my kind of knowledge base and yeah really at real the first the first couple of assignments I went oh, oh wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, yeah I've got a lot to do here <laughs> yeah and I do remember those first assignments as well yeah um, <laughs> some low grade <laughs> He's got um, a few. He's got a few to flash up on the screen. Here. <laughs> yeah, when someone said Harvard referencing, I was like, what? "Yeah, there you go." <laughs> I just got it off Google. What do you mean? <laughs> no, well, yeah. It's, I mean, in terms of that, I mean, that's that's a massive sort of sacrifice as a coach to sort of go and do a three-year degree alongside working full time. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's credit to you. And I guess since that. And I know you probably took a little bit of time off because I know you uh, probably hit a bit of a wall. Um, you know, in terms of continued development, how big of a part of that is you? Uh, I know we just touched on it, but moving forward as well. Yeah, massive. I, d- I don't think like, listen, I, I've been incredible, like incredibly fortunate who I work with and like 
I, I'm not daft. I, I don't think I'm the world's best coach. I think I'm a really good thief. I think I'm a really, yeah. really, really good thief. And what I, I probably went through a stage where I wanted everything. Um, I wanted to know everything about anything, whether I thought that was the way I was going to play, whether that's the way I'm going to play. Like even coming to Ipswich now, I'm working with people that I'm going get, like, never heard that. Let's work like uh, something simple. We have Jamie uh, who does our data at the within the academy. Unbelievable mind. Like I'm working with uh, John McGreal, Dave Dave Wright with our 23s coaches. So experienced footballers, so it, football league coaches, getting loads from them. Uh, Matt Pooley, our individual coach, level of technical detail. Like, yeah, I'm all the time. and But now I'm probably at a stage where I know what I want to, what I think football should look like for me. So I'm probably a bit more, I've gone from having the trawler and having the, the net wide. So I'm probably a bit more focused on what I need to learn now, what I need to go after, um, who I need to listen to, who I need to kind of um, take stuff from and speak with. And, and, and that's the kind of thing now where I, I've, done my advanced youth award i've done my a license and i'm probably not going to be on the pro license in the next five years so it's now right okay where what what do, what do the next bits look like and it, it's that now it's it's like i'm at the point now where it's targeting whereas before it was i'd listen to anyone like I, like lockdown i went through four notepads of just listening to any webinar any cpd just if you get one thing from it it's worth having like it's worth having and then now I, I stored everything on my laptop. I had like a big folder all broken down into bits. And then, uh, yeah, about about 12 months, 12, 18 months ago, I went, right, time to start. Like, I've got this big piece of marble. It's time to start chiseling the statue. <laughs> like, and like, let's like let's start doing that now. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's where I'm at now. Is like, now I think I, I still want to listen to everything, but I know what I'm listening for, if that makes yeah. sense. Absolutely, I, I, I think it's, it's brilliant. It's refreshing to hear as well because I think a lot, there's a lot of people that you we will all come across, and it doesn't make them any better or any worse as a yeah. coach as to how they go and apply to do it. But so many people ticking boxes to get a qualification, to get the the the, the bare minimum level yeah. that they need to have to get to where they need to get to. So, but it's really really refreshing and to hear you talk about like how how much how absorbing you are of it. And I think reference you made there, I love it. But they the the best ideas are stolen, aren't they? They're best stolen and and, and then I think the best people then manipulate the one the, the the things that they've stolen to to suit what they're what they're all about and what they like and 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 and, and it changes as well. I think that's really mm. important is that we don't we don't all know when exactly it is that, that you you start chiseling away like you're talking about. Yeah. We don't know when that time actually comes. So I think it is so important to be broad-minded and open-minded to, yeah. to the information that you can get from people and courses are excellent I'm sure the degree it's something I'd have loved to have done but I'm sure the degree was was fantastic as you as you value it and talking about that and and the application and the hard work that goes with it but once you start being able to work around some of the people that you've been able to yeah to come into contact with and you are like right now some of those names that you put in there is um that's when the real value can start coming in terms of the day to day as well, isn't it? Exactly. Like, like my move to Ipswich has been like it's exactly what I wanted. I was at a club for a really long time, a fantastic football club with fantastic staff, and I just wanted something new. I wanted new ideas. I wanted new and like sometimes you have to step out of your comfort zone. Like it's not easy leaving Man City, but you have to do it sometimes to to kind of grow and where I want to get to. And like I say, like the academy manager alone, his ideas, his way of thinking, his way of developing people. He's been at Norwich. It's worked at Norwich. It worked at Huddersfield. Like, why wouldn't I? Like, why wouldn't I sit and listen? Why, why like, Dean's a, he's got the experience. That's like, right, no problem. And let's work with it. And and, and that's, that's the big thing. I think it's the, you, you made a great point there about you. You don't you, you don't know when it's coming. I had like a. I remember the article. I, I read one article. Um, uh, Paco Cerillo, who Barcelona, he's like a professor, like unbelievable mind. And I found this article in Spanish, Google Translate, and I just read it. It was about two pages long, and it was one of the moments where I went, 
that's it. That's the validation I was looking for to kind of go, this is how I believe we should be, I believe we should develop footballers, whether they're eight, 18, 28. This is the way I would want to play if I ever was in charge of a full system. Like, no problem. Like, done. And it, it, it's like, it, 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 but it, it, like, I was in bed. Yeah. Like, like, light bulb, it, light bulb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't how people want, like, you're not sat in a classroom and like the sun shines through the window. And it's like, no, it's like, I was in bed. I couldn't sleep. The, like, Mrs. is going, come on, like, it's like daft o'clock, go to sleep. And you go, yeah, in a minute, in a minute. And it, like, that's what, like, sometimes that's when it happens. Um, yeah. You listen to some of the best, and they say that's when the best ideas come. Like, well, <laughs> I got advice to put a pen and paper next to next to the bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah, I've I, I, I got a really good friend of mine, or really someone that's, that I you know, really rate highly and, and, and share a lot of ideas with, with, and he emails himself. He emails himself at three yeah. o'clock in the morning or whatever it is that he, he wakes up. And um, yeah, some some people would say it's sad, wouldn't they? But at the same <laughs> yeah. time, I think you've got to be ready to react, like you just said there, because because the, the science the sun doesn't always shine through the window. It, mm. it comes at you at different times. So you got you got to be prepared for it. But but being open minded, I think is um is it, something that a lot of people think they are, but actually. I think by the way you're talking sh- shows and suggests that you definitely are towards towards becoming better and and and, and learning on the whole. And I think it, I think it's like being open minded to take it and being comfortable going and that doesn't apply to me. Like now yeah. you know like like but yeah. I think people are the opposite. I think sometimes people can that doesn't apply to me. But you haven't you don't know yet. Yeah, I, I, I was listening to um, Jamie Carragher talking and he was talking about. Um, like you said there, not having to use everything, not being great at everything was one of the references he made. He said that um, like he worked with Rafa Benitez and Rafa was an unbelievable coach, but didn't have particular feel towards his players. And then he talked about Gerard Julia. He said, could go and be a CEO at any top company because of the way he managed his people. But his coaching was nowhere near what Rafa's was. He said, and I think there's this perception that not just in football, but this is the topic that we're all talking about now, but that to be the best coach, manager, whatever it is, you've got to be brilliant at everything. And he said, it's that, that's just not the way that it works. But if you can have that open-minded approach and, and the good things come to you, then you, you, it's going to stand you in good stead. No, definitely. Like I, like I look at the staff I'm working with at under 18 at the minute and you have your MDT around and it'd be daft for me to think that I know all the answers. It'd be daft. Like, yeah. I, sometimes being a an important part of being a lead coach is knowing when to, in the nicest way, shut up. <laughs> like, yeah. like someone else, you're not the smartest in the room. That's fine, and being comfortable with that, and going like, that, that's fine. Like, you don't, you don't have to be the, uh, you don't have to be the, you're the face, but not necessarily the spokesperson. Like, and listen, there's times when you you have to make a decision and you have to say something that might have to come from you. But and that, that that's the same. What any manager, any any kind of like, so like one of my previous clubs, everyone will think the first team manager picks the team. He, he has the final say, but he listens to a lot of people on the way. He yeah. doesn't just go, this is the team and thanks for coming. So, like... Yeah, I think one of the things you get from that, that's really interesting there, you mentioned the MDT, because people probably don't understand the scale of what goes into managing an under-18s team or yeah, age yeah. group at, at a big club like Ipswich. But... I think that's one of the big things. Even if you have got all the answers, or you think you have, or you are, you know, you you are the spokesperson as well as yeah. the the face of it all. Part of your responsibility is to manage people, not just your players. So to get the best out of your staff, if you're putting a cap on them all the time and pushing them back into a cupboard, then then you're not going to get the best out of those people. And and therefore, when they are doing their job, where they do get that little bit of airtime, yeah. they're not going to be delivering it in the in in a natural manner. So you being able to give them the um, the opportunity to be open-minded to listening to what they've got to say helps them develop as well as the players, yeah. doesn't it? And that's just as important. Because like, I look at it, I, I was the other person. So I was yeah. really lucky. The first person I worked with full-time, Darren Hughes, like we were the under-10s coaches. He was like, he's one of the best coaches I know. Like he was unbelievable at giving me a chance. Like, you know, like, like this is someone that's like also got his own ambitions, also got his own career, also got his own ideas. But like, no, 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 like, and other people believe in that. Like you, you develop each other. The best yeah. environments, the best, the best cut. And that's not football. That in general, even when I was at the schools, the best, 
one of the best schools was in one of the worst areas. It's because they had a head teacher that let people do the job. Yeah. And uh, but and then they demonstrated the behaviours that. So so if I'm saying I want to be open minded and like like but then I don't demonstrate that then people can. Well, you you don't I don't believe you. you're not authentic you're not no and it takes uh, that takes incredible strength as well by the way like yeah. to, to be that person to be that head teacher that yeah. allows people the autonomy to make decisions and and get to the get get the success from your from your team of people like you just mentioned about your your MDT that you've got with you now and a lot of what we do is we're just and at the end of the day we're facilitators for the players to be the center of attention yeah my my, yeah, my, my, my job now and in my opinion never has <laughs> been never been about me I, and it's you you hear people saying it is it's like it's like a cheesy thing to say but it's not it's yeah. like I mean, if I'm like we, we're stressing massively at Ipswich is that see coaches and staff as a resource see us as a re- you use as much as us as you can ask us questions take our time it's at the end of the day it's what we're paid to do yeah. like we're, we're a we're a resource for every day for and 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 in my opinion that doesn't change whether they're 28 or 8 the difference is at eight is that they're probably not going to come and ask. It might be one dad that comes and asks. It might be auntie and uncle, granddad, grandma that comes and asks, brother or sister. That's fine, but it's still the same. It's it's being open minded to be a, a resource and just yeah, like I'm an open book. Like I'm here for you. I'll come and take what you need, and hopefully it puts you past me. Like, like especially under eighteen. Like like yeah, you absolutely. Mean, and, like I, I, the quicker we do it, the quicker you pass me, and you're on to the next person and getting as much as you can from them and. If you ever need to call back, call back. That that's a nice bit. Now, when yeah, you know, done it is that you see you, you get every now and again you get a player come back and go, "What's your thoughts on this? Like, what's your like?" And, and that's that's why it is nice. That, but I I always feel that's like like a little bit of a sign that you've cracked it a little bit as well. Is that yeah, yeah. someone picks the phone up and trusts the fact that they're after time? It's when they're having a rough time. Do you know yeah. what I mean? When it's not yeah. going right, that you get yeah. the phone call, but. Yeah. It's incredibly reassuring <clears throat> that you're the person that they pick the phone up to. Even no, hundred percent. And it's when it's when you see them at a game when you're least expecting it. We played a game a couple of weeks ago, and a boy that uh, I think he was under eleven when he came to City was playing for another club, and not seen him for a few years. And you go, oh, coming out, you catch up. Da da da. You actually help him get something yeah. else, and it's like, oh. You start, yeah, you start moving forward. Yeah, there's, there's as much value in that, isn't there, as there is seeing someone make their first team debut yeah, or yeah. go on and crack it and win the Champions League, whatever it might be. I think there's it, just as much um, value yeah. in terms of the relationships you've built with your players. And it's everyone appreciating that. that. Like, we got like, I, I had a, a period when I was doing the school stuff, we had like a, a branch of it, it was like a grassroots club. Um, we were paid coaches, it was run different, we weren't like parents, so we were. It's the same thing through the like the company. Um, it's still going now. It's a fantastic grassroots club, like because they've stuck to what they believe in and how they do it. Yeah. And, and it was still the same then. It was just the, the goals different. So yeah, because it's here. Yeah. So so now the players I'm really fortunate to work with are all aiming for the first team. They might not all get there. They probably won't all get there. When we was at grassroots, they all want to play for an academy. They might not all get there. No. It, it's still making sure that the. That the people, everyone's growing. Yeah, everyone comes back to that. It comes yeah. back to the first thing that you mentioned, really, in terms of being able to do that for everybody, whether yeah. or not they go off to being an accountant after they're released. Like, it's still, yeah. it's still providing everybody with a platform and an opportunity in it. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, that's that's all you are. You showcasing, and you made a great point before. You salesman, but you are selling the players. You yeah. how can you, how can you market these players? Are you, are you doing enough in training to make them look the best? Are you, doing, are you teaching them the skills of good people that when the time comes, when they go to another club, when they walk in, they make the right impression. They, when you know, when they walk in for a job interview, if they decide to leave football, people go, oh, you can tell they've been at Oldham, Man City, Ipswich. Yeah. It's really important. Really, really yeah, important. Big time. I agree. And then, um, yeah, just, I mean, just go on, James, are you going to say something? I was just going to, I was going to, uh, slightly well just going back to what you said in your sort of introduction and the, the importance of those people uh that sort of mentored you so you mentioned Andy Barlow yeah uh, and obviously Jeff Lomax and different people like that so what is it about them that made them so you know relatable to you in terms of you know what were the skill sets yeah. they give to you and and, and have you been using them yourself because obviously you talk so well about your relationships yeah. with players and that 
And I suspect Vadigas is probably a little bit of a what you learned from them. Yeah, no, like like certainly like J- Jeff and Neil probably because it was a longer period spent with them than the spent with Andy. You saw the connection they had, like because like years ago when you obviously did your B and your A, it was like Judgment Day, weren't it? On your assessment yeah. day, they were probably the first people I saw who were like it's like a big blow if you don't like like that skill set of like you know delivering bad news. It's like it's not always good. Um, yeah, I, I think I think we're kind of like like Paul Lever as well, who was at Man City's like you F A Y C D like just real. I, I think the first thing that attracts you to him is that like, and it's this is the same with players. That I think these I think these two questions that every every player asks: um, Can you make me better? And do you care? And I think for people that are really open minded, they probably ask the first one first. Can you like? Can you can you make me better? And that's I think the first thing that attracted me to all these people. Like I, I know you can make me better here, like I really do. Then by how you're making me better and how you're teaching me and your time you're investing in me, I know you care. So I'm like I'm in. Like whatever you say, and that's probably the biggest thing um, that kind of and and like I've heard loads of speak people speak about that. Like that it's not like that's quite an open thing. But I think that's the same with coaches. I think that's the same with staff. If you're a, if you've got a business, I think it's like, can you make can you make me better? Yeah, great, right. And you care. Oh, perfect. Like mm-hmm. some people are really like comfortable. Uh, if you can make me better, great. I don't really. I'm not. If you don't care, no problem. But I can, I can live with that. Some people need to know you care, and that and that again, it goes back to knowing your players and knowing your people and going right. What do they need first? So like when I went into Ipswich, I like that was kind of my big thing. He's like, do they need like some players will need to know that I can make them better. Some players will need to know that I really care about them first and earn that right to then show that I can make them better. And that's fine. Like there's no like so yeah, that'd be the big thing for me is that these that these people I think like I think early on were that they can make me better. So that was like a real attraction, like the the knowledge and the level of detail. I think as I've got a bit older, is that like like. Do you, do you care about me getting better or are you doing it for you? <laughs> like if you right now I'm a bit more down the line. I probably I'm probably the other way now where do you care about me? Yeah, right, great. Oh, and you can make me better. Perfect. Because sometimes as you get a bit older, you don't you don't need as much knowledge. You just need a, a voice of reason. You just need a bounce board. You just need a, a sort of an ear, just a um yeah, just to kind of Yeah, support. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. Just the final bit on that, because obviously you mentioned the Oldham coach. Forgive me, I forgot his name, but you know, oh, it yeah. Tony be, Phyllis, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's it. One. Wouldn't be. Uh, I, I do scribble, but I didn't scribble that down quick enough. Um, but you touched on that. You have a lot of respect for him, even though he let you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. So for all those coaches that are doing those difficult conversations, and I know a lot of it's happening in the states yeah. at the minute. What was it that? You know, how did he deliver that that made you yeah. still hold him in that yeah. sort of regard? Because that's yeah. quite a, yeah, it's a know, tough one. Yeah. It's a tough one. Um I think the big thing that's really important whenever I've tried to do it as well is like when I'm going into that meeting, I need to my thought is one, I need to be really honest. Like um when I found out I was leaving Bradford, the person that delivered the message was brilliant. First thing he said, you're not getting another contract. So all that kind of there's no kind of build up. There's no kind of like like yeah. Dramatic. No X factor moment. Yeah, is yeah it? exactly. It's yeah. like right. This is what's happening, right? And then you start talking about next steps. And I think that's the big thing that kind of I've kind of took from like whenever that's happened to me is that, and the aftercare is so important. So like when I when I went in the room with Tony, Tony had he delivered a really harsh message to me, my mum, my dad that you're not getting a scholarship. You worked all that. You've been there three and a half years. Like you thought you were there and you're not. He also then gives you uh, an avenue after, like, but these are the steps, like, these are the clubs, these are the... So he didn't have to do that. No one has... In my opinion, you do have to do that. In my opinion, morally, you have to do that. Like, you have to have an aftercare. But at the time, there wasn't as much as what's going on now. Um, So at the time, he didn't, and he did. He was ahead of the time in that kind of stuff. And, And that's the big thing for me is that, you, you have to go in and be really honest. Don't like sugarcoat it. Don't like, like read the room. So how you'd like, if you're talking with the boy, then listen, that's like the language you use and your body language and how you frame it's different 
but you can't come away from the fact of what you're saying. They can't come out thinking, I'm not really sure what's what's happened there. I'm not really sure what act, what's actually been said to me there. I, I'm getting released, but I'm really good. Like, how's that work? Like, no, no, no. Like, so so that was that was the thing where it's like, listen, you're getting released. It's fine. These are the reasons. Da, da, da. We think someone's better. No problem. These are the avenues. Boom, done. Checking up on me after. Um, and yeah, that yeah, that that's the thing. I think that's like, and whenever I've tried to do that, like we were involved recently in the ones that are under 18 at Ipswich, and, and they're not easy. They're not, they're not, they're, they're not um the easiest thing for coaches and people in them positions is to go, yeah, everyone's getting a three-year deal on 50 grand a week and everyone's happy and we all score like everyone high five. It's not the real world. Um so it, it's that it's that honesty. Um and then, but having the emotional intelligence to know, right, brutal honesty, right, emotional intelligence, right, what do they need now? Sometimes you're pointless talking. If someone's really emotional, like I've been in meetings with parents and players where it's like the the they knew it was coming. So it's like the emotions finally burst and then it's like whatever we say now is pointless. We might as well just diffuse and pick it up at a later date. That would be the other thing I would say as well is that if you are in their meetings, like, like I had half an idea it was coming <laughs> and I think that's good. Like, I don't think any player should go into a meeting thinking, like, listen, you might get a bit of difference. You thought you were getting this and you're getting this or you like, but it can't be like one up here and one, like, I thought I was going to be first team captain and I'm getting released. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I do. And I think the way that academies are set up these days is that that shouldn't happen anyway, should it? That no, no. The amount of reviews and the amount of time that's spent going through and, and updating and addressing where players are at, you should never be. Of course, there will always be that glimmer of hope, won't there, for yeah, a player course. that's getting yeah. released or, or something along them lines. But you shouldn't be ever walking into the room thinking those drastic differences, should they? Because as, as coaches, we're not doing our jobs properly if we're not, if we're not leading them and being honest with them 100% well before that time I think that's a big thing is that you, you're you putting them on a pedestal you build it but it's made out of marshmallow <laughs> like yeah. not one swoop yeah. and it's coming down and like I'll be dead honest like I've, I've said this to parents in the past I think like all for promoting your son but because, because he's your son he's not a footballer at whatever club at under 11 he doesn't need a sock sponsor he doesn't need a He's he's a boy that happens to kick a ball for a club. Like we we always say, like we always used to say, it when, like when, when we go abroad and we play, like we play two summers ago, we played Barcelona. You see the lads in the change room and looking, going, lad, you're not playing Lewandowski. Yeah, yeah like, he's jabbing in yeah, yesterday. Yeah, don't worry, yeah. like Messi's not going to turn around the corner in a minute. You're playing another group of lads who've just got a Barca kit on, like you've yeah. got a Man City kit on. I, and I think I think that's the big thing is that for people that are going to do their meetings is is you can do loads of steps before loads of steps before to make sure that the 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 news isn't isn't bad yeah isn't, re- like, isn't reaching the peak yeah, but, yeah. and that, like, i look i look back at like the 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 two well i've been released three times but two i got told um one i found out in the newspaper i'd avoid doing it like that yeah <laughs> um yeah i think the, the, yeah yeah that was a shock um the the two other times is that it's been brutal honesty like there's no like this is what it is. It was really clear, but there was really good steps before, yeah. and there was good steps after. Um, because they're not easy. No one wants to do it. Like no, and you know you touched upon there about the Barcelona kid. Someone actually said to me a little while ago about we we obsess about the point one percent or whatever it is that, of kids that are going to make it. Why can't at academies can we not just celebrate that we're putting the best players that are in a Man City shirt or Ipswich yeah. shirt at this particular age group going out there to play very very good football over a period of time for however long it is that they're there? We we don't need to obsess. We all know what the outcome looks like, but it's no different to what it would be in any other huge walk of life. And I think some of the things that you've talked about in that last little passage have all been relatable to. I haven't worked in many other businesses and and fields, but if you associate with other businesses and we talked about Gerard Houllier being a good CEO, hey. all them um, people skills, all those treatments, all those, all that planning can go into how you treat anybody in any walk of life, can't they? I, I think like I think academy it baffles me. Academy football gets a bad rap. So I look at a boy that plays at an academy, they normally get free kit, free training by qualified staff, not parents, qualified staff. They play on safe pitches. 
get the kit washed, the match kit gets washed for them normally. They get changing rooms, they get referees guaranteed, they get tournaments, they get tours. And and they got what oh well, academies and it's a bad route. And I go, oh, like as long as we're saying that like this might not last forever, mm. what more do you want? For, like, you're gonna pay for this. And and the other bit as well that I always say, and it's like, you know what you're signing up for? Yeah. You're gonna be judged. If you don't want to be judged, that's absolutely fine as well, by the way. So if I didn't want to be yeah. judged as a coach, a coach is a grassroots coach. That's absolutely fine. Like, that's absolutely fine. I want to be judged. I'm competitive. Yeah, I want to be, right. I want, I want to be. I want to be told where I need to get better. I want to be like pushed. I want to be challenged. That's why I'm in the job I'm in. I think that's. I think that's a big thing that is getting better. Is understanding that it's not. It's it. It's how we describe them. So they're not like. I worked with a coach at City, and he he was brilliant in uh, Adam Temple in saying like, they're not ballers, they're not footballers, they're not the, the boys. Yeah, and you, like yeah. us being really clear with the language up until what like when when do you like for me until you've played under league games I don't think you can count yourself as a footballer anyway so like like I I was never a footballer <laughs> like I might have been played to keep a ball out of it but I certainly weren't a footballer like yeah. that and that that's the thing I think where and whether that's in England whether that's in America wherever that is is it's being just like that that language that you use around it like yeah. Really it's, like, it's like what you say when people have a question mark over six and seven year olds, five, six, seven year olds being yeah. a being a professional football club. As long as they're coming away with a smile on their face and they're enjoying the experience, it doesn't matter where they're doing it, does it? I used to I used to say when I was involved in that, like people used to say, Oh, just they've got to pick us. And I'm going, No, no, no. Like I understand why they want to take them to different clubs. It's the only time in the if they're gonna be successful, it's gonna be the only time where they're actually allowed to be at two big clubs at once, three big clubs. My argument was, was when you start going three, four, and your whole week's dominated by it. Yeah. Like, my advice true. always used to be was when when you're six, seven, eight, pick the club you think's the best, and pick the club you like, whether that's a club you support, whether that's a club that's local, whatever it is, and just go with them too. If you're really yeah. lucky, it'll be the same club, and you only have to go to one. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. If you re- yeah, if you really really, look. but like then, you, like I, I like. If I if I look back, like my brother was my brother signed at City. <laughs> like I wind my mum and dad up so much now. We used to do United, Liverpool, City, Blackburn at the time with a big club in the area. And you like, you go like, what were you doing? <laughs> like, like, and like it's just like it's just like they didn't have the education. Now they look back and they go, like, yeah, hey, probably a bit much, weren't it? Like, and in the end, they ended up making a decision where he signed for Man City as a young boy because it, it worked. Like he had Man City and Liverpool as options, and Liverpool just didn't work. And I think that's the thing now. Like you see, like some of the stuff around, like going to four clubs, and like yeah, that's when it does get like like yeah. when we was at City. The, in fairness, they made a big shift for the foundation phase. They used to train four days a week and a game of the weekend, and they said we're taking too much of the time. Let's get rid of a night. We'll make the nights the here longer, so we keep the time because we believe in the methodology. But we're giving them back a night as a family and as a as a child and like that, that, and the other kids the other kids in the family that need to do their yeah. own work and have dinner at a normal time and, and like yeah like being a family like you only get one yeah. like, one way through it don't you so it's like yeah. it's but that that for me is like like I think where there the can be so much more appreciation of academy football but yeah. also like like be re- like like realize what it is it's just a great addition it's yeah. just it's, it's what 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 a way to grow up. Like, yeah, I don't at, worry about what's at the end of it. Worry, yeah. enjoy, worry about enjoying what yeah, you're going yeah. for rather than yeah. where it's going to get to. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the big thing when you're working with the younger players is is just you know think think on that and and it helps keep people on the floor. And now the it, it's it's miles better the aftercare, especially in England. Like the 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 aftercare, it needed to be better, and things have happened that have made it be better. Unfortunately, like unfortunate things have happened for it to get to that. Like really sad things, but it's, now it's in a place where it's like right, it's got like the aftercare bit's so important. Yeah, massive. One of the things that I would ask you is, if you can put this in a city context, please. But I, I love the fact that you've come gone through so many of the age groups at, at, at one club. Mm-hmm. And I think hopefully you'd agree with me that if it was if it was Berry's Academy, it would have still had the same value as it was as Man yeah, City. Yeah, yeah. Man City is the big 100%. the big attraction. Um 
But I think it'd be really just firstly, just to give us a little bit of an idea about how that looked for you, you know, going through different age groups and the demands of, of it being City and trying to develop the best players in the world, if you like. Yeah. Um, and then how maybe that looked different across a couple of the age groups. If you yeah, know. yeah, I um, it, it, it's an unbelievable place and it's relentless. So I, I'm not 30 yet and I look 40. <laughs> it, it, it's a real it's a relentless place to to work because we want we wanted to be the best at everything. We wanted to be like not just good. We wanted to be the best at everything and we wanted to and we wanted the best players and the best recruitment and, and that that takes a real commitment that and that's not for everyone and that's fine. Like that's absolutely fine. It's it's I will find it very hard not to be like that moving forward, like to have that kind of like, no, 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 if we're doing it, we're doing it properly and we're doing it um, thoroughly. I think the the kind of, the, the, the key bit for City that I think is, you probably see in the way I speak now and the way I plan and is the clarity and the consistency. So what a player looks like in terms of position, what's expected, of a right back at under nine, 10, 11, 12, what feeds into what could a play that we think could be a right back at under 14. What does that look like at nine? We all know we all have the same language. So the playing style is consistent. Um, and this kind of goes back to the stuff I was saying about the, the, uh, the Barcelona professor, like they, they had a thing called socio effective superiority. It's a really fancy word. Basically, it means that we understand each other better than anyone else does. The reason Barcelona, I think, will be the best ever side and will never be a better is he was speaking a football language that only they spoke. Like, like it's so clear. And that's what City was trying to get. I think. The other bit they did really well as well is that when most clubs are looking at the structure, when you go in, you have a first team manager comes in and they have to change the board and then the academy. When the manager came in, Guardiola came in, you had a board who were already aligned, Rodolfo who had set the academy up and Jason ready to carry it on. The actual missing piece was the manager. That's where City was just like in... Ferran, cheeky, the board, like just streaks ahead of like the, the time, which kills me as a Man United fan. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and it was it, it was it was the consistency and the clarity. So we all know what we needed to play like. We the challenge was, and I think the big misconception was was that people think that it's. A to B to C to D, and you take all the creativity. It's not so. The best analogy I can give you about how I believe football should work, um, and you laugh at this, but it's I actually think it's quite fitting. If if I was to put a picture up now of the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, what what's it in? So it's in an art gallery, but it's in a frame. So you've got the most beautiful painting in the world, the most valuable painting, but you still got a frame around it. That's what we did at City. We were really clear with our frame and our clarity. And that's what I try and do now. And that's what I believe football should be, is that it's the frame. What goes on in that frame is the players. The players own that. So if they want to throw paint at the wall, that's fine. It's not a billboard. It's This is what it is. Mm -hmm. And what goes in is what's owned by the players. <clears throat> set these so bits. Can I, can I just jump on that, Callum? Because yeah. that, that, that for me, again, I know I keep dragging it back to similar sort of thing, yeah. but I really just... I, it, it, what, basically, what you're telling us is it doesn't have to all look exactly how we all think it should look. And it's dependent on what you've got in front of you yeah, right now. 100%. So if, we, if we've got... So as long as we set the framework right and the concepts and the ideas are consistent, then in theory anyway the painting shouldn't look a million miles away from each no, other. No, of course not. No, but, no, yeah. It's right, like, yeah. But as long as you set that, how the paint hits the canvas is up to the, the skill set of the players you've got. Yeah. So at like, the moment. At, at, the, moment. Moment, at the moment, yeah. yeah. So like, like uh, I look at the, uh, Ben and Jamie with the under 18s, I've got a group of players that have got 
some really exciting dribblers, some really dynamic players, um, some really forward thinking. They might not be as patient as maybe a previous group. So they might be a bit more relentless with their attacking. That's absolutely fine as long as it's within the constraints. Of, yeah, as long as you're not going straight from A to B. Yeah, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's not, it's not, four, it's not four, four, two. It's not yeah. big, big David. No, cool. You're up front, and we're hitting yeah. David. Like, like, and by the way, if that's you, that's absolutely fine as well. As long it's as right, you're still with it. Yeah. And, and I think, you, you, for me, I think that's a quite a good context to put it in. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm no, no, no. Like putting words in your mouth, but just find it interesting. Is that if you've got a big front man in a Man City team, you're going to utilize what his strengths are, or what's going to help him develop, aren't you? You're, you're not gonna you're not gonna get it at right back and crash everything towards him, but you're you're gonna play at times to get balls into the box or to get balls into that player to help him become the player that you hope he will. So you look at like so there's a lot of talk at the minute about City making the box in midfield, first thing. Now I I, I I'm not trying to say I don't know what Pep's thinking is. Please don't be thinking that I've sat and had coffee with him and gone, he's shown me this is what this is, and it, far from it. But from my understanding, he had that last year. How he did it was different, he didn't have Haaland. So last year we had a false nine, so it's dead easy to drop, like it's dead dead easy to drop that player into the top of the box, and you make the box that way. This year he's got a player that has to play number nine and on the last line because he's every team's petrified of him. Yeah. So you have to have the same idea, but you make the box in a different way. That is, are they still playing the same way? Yeah. <laughs> have they changed the style? No. Yeah. All they're doing is tweak it, and that goes back to again play. It, and the, in fairness, you always hear Pep Guardiola say it: the players own it. Yeah. Like so that that, but just because he's got a big six foot five centre forward who's a machine, it, has he been a bit more longer? Yeah, that's the other bit of misconception of City is that like we we want the we wanted the ball, but we want to score. Yeah. If you can score as quick as you can with quality. There's a big difference between so the goal uh, De Bruyne scores against Arsenal. It's not a punt. That's a like a logical pass into Haaland because it's the freest <laughs> pass anyone else is man marked. It's just logical. It's not like it's not like we, we said we were no, going to bring it up, Carol. So, sorry, mate. Yeah. You're developing decision uh, makers yeah. as well. Like, so everything you talked about earlier is about providing players with the tools to become and make the right decisions at the right time. And and ultimately, the, the, that reference to that goal in particular is about not being able to play a certain pass because you're under pressure, but being yeah. able to play a more progressive one that allows you to ultimately score, but to get up the pitch, I suppose. Yeah, 100%. And this is where, like, now at Ipswich, like, the first team manager, Kieran McKenna, unbelievable manager. Like, from a, like from the small time I've been here, you can see, unbelie- like, unbelievable manager. What's he got? Real consistency. Consistency in language, identity, like behavior, attitude. Like if if anyone, if if people have watched this and take nothing else, if you work for a football club or you work for a business, just get consistency. Write down what you want and what it looks like, and you'll be fine. Because that is what the best do. You could you you could now, like I'm a Man United fan. Why have Man United done a bit better this year? You could probably predict after the first two games, he's he's not really changed much since. So you could pretty much predict his FA Cup final team if everyone was fit. You'd probably get eight out of 10, nine out, uh, eight out of 11, nine out of 11, right? You look at the best teams that have always done well. The Liverpool team that was like the Stop City winning the league, you could have picked that team. Like, or you'd have certainly got nine out of the 11, right? It's consistency. It's consistency of idea, of message, of... Um, language it is so important it's so so important and it's a free advantage so it and, and that's the big thing that like it, it it's it's fine to have variety in formation so you don't always have to play the same formation you don't always have to play the same like you don't like you don't always have to be 4-3-3 three, three. you can be 4-2-3-1 three, three, you can be 3-4-3 three, three. you can be but knowing what you're going after is really important like no, and that helps people. That it goes back to you know you're talking about like uh like memory memory overload, and like you stress you stressing too much. If if every every week we're chopping and changing what it looks like and what we how we put like or this week we're 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 not doing this but we're doing that. It's like it's not easy that. And then you're trying to teach them a really complex game. It's 
it's tough. And some people argue and say you've got to be variety. I, like I, I can understand that, but from my experience and what I've seen, consistency is key. Yeah, but you can have variety within your consistencies as well, can't you? Do you know what I mean? You can chop and change a right-footed winger to play on the left, or or vice versa. You know, you you've got you've got lots of of, of tweaking and manoeuvring that, yeah. which is what the best do anyway, isn't it? When it's not going to plan. I think if you keep the consistency of a team, you can move people in different positions to get what you want them to work on out of. So if you, if you've got a if you've got a midfielder that doesn't play longer passes, we'll play him at centre back. Play, I play him at right, play him at right back, and say, by the way, you've got this game, you've got to hit five passes to the other channel. Team hasn't changed. Yeah, just added right. real variety to the player's game. Like that's like that's variety. What you're not doing is putting him at right back. And last week we were four four two, and now he's a wing back in a three five two, and he's like everything else has changed. It's like no, no, no. You, like that's still the same. That's your safety. This is your stretch. Yeah. Like that's fine. No, brilliant, mate. And uh, uh, you've given us loads on that because um, yeah. I've got I had loads of things I wanted to ask you about it. But I think I want what the reason behind my question was to try to get people to be able to see what the inner yeah yeah, yeah. Side is it, of it is it, like. And I think yeah, it, you could there all night perfect. and told us about what it was like when you did the under sevens yeah. and then the under nines and then the, and 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 broke it all down forever. And the the, the information would have been incredible for everybody yeah. but i think that's that is what you just told us there is so relatable for everybody like you said the amount of times after the conversation of we think football is exclusive it's not it's there's so many skills that are transferable from outside to into football and vice versa um but i think that's one thing that whoever you are whatever group you're working with whoever your group of players are whether it's a team or soccer scorer if you've got consistency with your players if you plan if you think about what you do if you put the players at the forefront of what it is you're trying to achieve and you've got something that you are trying to achieve it doesn't particularly matter how you go about it it's yeah. about making sure that the players are of course it does matter I, I, I didn't mean that flippantly but if, as long as you're putting your players at the forefront of it and you've got a direction that you're working towards then 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 we we've given we're giving them an opportunity to to develop and progress, and, and then it's relatable to the big, you know, big, if not the biggest or the, or the or the best club in the world at the moment. There's a big misconception from my time at City, and a lot has changed. Like it's not like it, it and like a lot has changed and move with the times, and it has to. Like it can't stand still as well. Like, yeah. well, there was a big misconception. It's all team. It's all pass the ball. It's it's not. It's not a lot of our work was like. So if you ever listen to. Any coach that talks about positional play and all that is so they all want one v one specialists. Yeah, you can't play like that and then not coach one v one. Like the reason there's a reason Grealish was hundred million. Yeah. There's a reason Sancho's seventy five, Anthony's eighty, and these play like you know like they're expensive. There's also a reason a Kanji was only seventeen. You, you know what I mean? Like like it's like. I think that. there's also this this um again I mentioned earlier about a game looking like a real game. And yeah. if an under nine or ten is playing it, it shouldn't look exactly the way, same way that it does on the television. And I think what sometimes gets misunderstood is that those players that are passers that are playing off a of one and two touch have mastered the techniques and mastered the ball and mastered the things that you've talked about earlier about way to pass, where to pass it, how to pass it, whatever it might be that becomes their real world-class yeah. thing. They've spent time over the years of developing their techniques and their attributes to manipulate the ball and be comfortable to then become Rodri that, that's, you know, yeah. that, that, that plays the type of game that he does. Um, but if he hadn't have mastered the skills and techniques to get there, yeah, he wasn't always a playoff one and two touch or no, no, deep no. holding midfield do you know what I mean so that, that I think that sometimes that can be the little bit that we lose is that yeah it, it, those players haven't always looked like that they've been developed to 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 have the skills and the techniques that ultimately have got them to the level to be able to perform and then they start to master what it is that they're gonna they're gonna be or what they've become yeah the habit is they need it all and that's the hard work for coaches you need it all like yeah. like Grealish needs passing as much as he needs dribbling. Rodri needs dribbling as much as he needs passing because Rodri will be under pressure and he has to twist and turn out. It's yeah. the same at any level. It's 
it's the skills of centre like centre forwards, like well, they need to score, but they also need one v one defending because a lot of teams are high pressing now. So if you can't defend one v one or one v two as a forward, you're yeah. probably not going to do so well. Yeah. So, like there's a reason Gabriel Jesus went for a lot of money because he's listen, he's a great footballer, but he's also a really aggressive defender. He was good at one v one defending. Yeah. So that's the hard bit for coaches. Yeah, brilliant. We've made it sound a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, if only, if only. Yeah, James, I'm going to pass you on because I've uh, again we've uh, taken up a lot of Callum's time, so I'm going to pass on to you, mate, for your famous quick fire round. I try and make them quick. I won't waffle. What is your favourite book? Yeah, uh, from a coaching point of view, Douglas Mav, coach's guide to teaching. Uh, from a, yeah, that one. Can't, can't recommend that. Other highly. books are available. Uh, from a normal book, uh, is it Shoe Dog? The story about Nike. Yeah, yeah top book. Yeah, I used to collect trainers back when I was trying to be a pretend footballer. So, <laughs> at Oldham. Yeah, at Old, yeah, Bradford, Bradford. I didn't get many on the wages at Bradford and Barrow, but yeah. <laughs> uh, your favourite podcast? You're gonna laugh, but it's not an. I try, I try and do a mix of podcasts where they're good and. Just a bit of downtime. So I listen to Under the Cosh all the time. I went and watched it live, and it's just like old football stories. So it's like it, it's good. It's good for that. And then, yeah, I think the obvious ones like uh, the Diary of a CEO. Is it Stephen Bartlett? Mm-hmm. I, I like that as well because it's a bit away from sport. So it's a bit again trying to pick stuff that's maybe outside your comfort zone. But yeah, Under the Cosh for feet up and working Diary of a CEO. It's very different there, by the way. Very yeah. different. <laughs> um, your sporting hero? The, the one I look up to, maybe Ronaldinho. I can still watch videos of Ronaldinho now and just go, like, big kid like that when Ronaldinho comes out. Like, I've got his shirt upstairs, like, I had the boots, even as a keeper. <laughs> I had the boots. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, Ronaldinho. Best piece of advice you've received? Don't complicate it. Yeah. Go for everything. Yeah. For everything. <laughs> if you could go back and give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? <laughs> Do the gym. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> take the risk. Take more risk. All right, throw yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah. I, I think I think there was a bit of like when I first thought about leaving playing and like just going coaching. I think it was a bit of like, oh, don't really want to take that dive yet, but we should have done it. I wish I have really done it back, gone all in 100% quite quick. Greatest learning experience? <laughs> the degree is close, mate. <laughs> the, 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 degree, the degree is close. I must have to admit, for a lot of things, especially, yeah. Um, yeah, or probably my first year in full-time. Tell like the first week in full-time. Like, yeah, I went... Like being in a meeting, being in like a full MDT meeting, normally just getting the notes after it because I was had something else on. So yeah, the first week in full time was as a coach was yeah a bit of a bump to earth. What is your favourite meal to cook? My missus is the cook. To be fair, my missus is the cook. Um, I'm probably gonna say yeah lasagna. Like yeah, she, yeah. We're veggie in this house because my missus is vegetarian. So veggie lasagna at home or when I'm out, it's a lasagna as well, a normal lasagna. So, yeah, lasagna is the easy winner. Got to have garlic bread, though. <laughs> Got to have garlic bread. This one we've done before, um, but what three celebrities would you invite to dinner? Uh, da, da, da. One has to be football orientated. Yeah, Pep Guardiola. I'd invite JFK. Love studying that stuff. Yeah, like eye opening. He to eat it. Yeah, he reveals some secrets. Um, Pet Guardiola, JFK, and Peter K. So what <laughs> Peter K today doing mix. some work? So yeah, what a mix. Yeah. Peter K and Pep. Imagine that. Yeah, come on, tell him it. Yeah, get your jokes going. <laughs> yeah. And then the final one. What is the most important lesson you've learned over your career? Enjoy it. Like. It's tough, but enjoy it. Like <laughs> enjoy the good moments and like really take them in. Take take pictures of it, record it, do whatever it is. But like, yeah, I think sometimes I look back and I've had some moments where I've like skipped over them. Like I had one where 
we went on a trip. We played Brussels Dortmund in the morning, went to Universal Studios in the afternoon. I've got about two photos from the day and I look back and I go like, it's a ridiculous day. What, like, who gets to do that? Like, enjoy the moment, like, savour the moment you're in because they're, uh, yeah, they're good. It's tough, but it's good. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. We, we understand our, um, our, even though it's the off season, but our, um, how busy you can be and, and your time's precious. But honestly, some of the stuff you've given us tonight will be, um, be invaluable for people. So thanks very much. And I think on behalf of everyone at the Coaches Coffee Club, we, we really appreciate you, you giving up your evening. I appreciate it. My first one doing anything like this as well. So I appreciate it. Well, it's good. It's good to do it. Thank you.